Well, I just heard the noon whistle here at Fort Atkinson, Wisconsin. So this is the time for me to say that this is Steve Larson uh, with the editorial uh, staff of, here at, at Ward Dairyman and welcoming all of you who are with us. Uh, always glad to have you uh, with us live, so to speak, real time. And uh, the list is growing and we, uh, we appreciate your, your participation. One quick comment uh, again, that those of you who have just joined us, you can download the handouts that will uh, be presented today, the PowerPoints, by going to the menu uh, on your control panel and following along with us that way if you'd like to. And with those uh, opening comments, uh, the topic today, uh, uh, breath of fresh air, ventilating barns. Uh, we're welcoming Dr. Cook from the University of Wisconsin Vet School. And I'm going to turn control over to Mike Hutchins at the University of Illinois, our co-host and partner in this adventure for uh, an introduction and to get us rolling. So Mike, take it away. Thank you very much, Steve. It's always a pleasure to introduce a, a good uh, professional co-worker and friend, Dr. Nigel Cook. Uh, he is professor, as, uh, as Steve mentioned, in, uh, in the food animal production medicine section at the University of Wisconsin-Madison in the School of Veterinary Medicine. Uh, he got his uh, DVM degree, according to my notes, in 1992 and worked in the southern part of England for four years before moving to the Royal Veterinary College and where he spent three years as a lecturer and head of the large animal ambulatory clinic. I think when you hear Dr. Cook speak, you'll discover he is not originally from Wisconsin and we'll let him work with that twang. But the good news is 1999, he decided to come to Wisconsin and is very active in the teaching and research area over there. He helped develop the, the Dairyland Initiative. This is a resource that's available to anybody in the world, actually, to look at to creating a welfare-friendly dairy cattle situation in 2010, and he indicates to me that they've gotten some very good external funding for that. He currently is chair of the Department of Medical, uh, Medicines, uh, Medical Sciences and was past president of the American Association of Bowman Practitioners, known as AABP. So, Dr. Coleman, we are so excited to please and to have you on board with us today to talk about your webinar on a breath of fresh air ventilating bars. Dr. Nigel Cook, it is your program. Well, thank you much. Um, we're going to talk about uh, a little bit of ventilation for cow barns. Um, and uh, with uh, 75 slides, I've got a bet with Mike that I can get through this in 45 minutes. So hold on tight. Um, this is the thermoneutral zone uh, figure for adult and, and uh, uh, young calves. And generally, cows do quite well within a range of temperatures between 40 and 70 degrees Fahrenheit. They're quite remarkably cold tolerant, uh, but on the top end, as you can see, uh, our cows become heat stressed uh, quite a ways before humans are bothered by heat. We'll be looking at 70, 75 degree days and thinking they're just wonderful, but our cows are heat stressed. And part of that is that high producing cows generate a lot of heat. This is the British thermal units, BTUs per hour, uh, for a resting human, you can see how pitiful we are down here at our heat generation. Uh, a 40 uh, pound uh, milk cow, uh, quite considerably more, but you see here our very high producing 120 pound average cows. Look at the amount of heat they're producing, twice as much uh, as a 40 pound cow. And, you know, traditionally these cows have been housed in naturally ventilated barns. Um, so just to review the principles of natural ventilation, which has done us well for decades of, uh, of ag building, uh, we have an open ridge uh, at the top here. We have open eaves and that air enters through the eaves, is warmed uh, by the animals within and through the process of thermal buoyancy that, uh, that air leaves through the ridge. Uh, that flow of air requires adequate interior roof slope, about a one in four minimum slope there. And when the wind blows, it will assist that flow uh, by creating that uh, negative pressure around the ridge and helping draw that air uh, out of the barn. But we've got these uh, high producing cows, the temperatures get hotter, they're producing lots of heat. And so the, uh, the factors that come into play uh, during the summer in particular are making sure that the wind uh, enters the, uh, a more open sidewall, so minimally opened at least half the uh, half the height of the sidewall and preferably much more than that and making sure that those facilities are free of wind shadows uh, becomes really important 
and orienting the barn, typically where we're located an east-west orientation uh, is preferred, and that helps us get through the summer. But sometimes uh, we're challenged. This is a windrose map for Madison, Wisconsin in July, and the, uh, the depth of these petals on the windrows uh, will suggest to you the amount of time that the air generally comes, the winds generally come from the south and southwest. Hence, we'll orient our barns lengthwise east and west to try to capture those winds optimally. But up here uh, on this uh, windrose plot, we see calm air uh, almost 20% of the time. So sometimes the wind doesn't blow, and then we're uh, left with uh, minimal ventilation uh, in a naturally ventilated uh, facility that's quite a challenge to keep cows cool in during the summer. Uh, well, our industry's uh, expanding. We've, we've got more cows per, uh, per herd, and uh, uh, that uh, single barn on top of a hill that did us quite well with natural ventilation is challenged when we start to build multiple uh, facilities, uh, one on top of each other. The, uh, the barn downwind will provide uh, a shadow uh, to the next one along. And just to demonstrate what that looks like, this is a computational flow dynamic model uh, of a two mile an hour wind uh, hitting uh, a 500 cow barn. Uh, it's upwind from another 500 cow barn with a 100 feet between. And the fast air speeds are shown in the, uh, the red here, slow speeds are in the blue. And you can see the impact that this uh, construction of this facility uh, upwind of this one has on the ventilation and the airspeed that we're seeing uh, in the barn downwind. And you can see that on an angle in this, uh, in this diagram here. So as uh, facilities have got larger, as cows have produced more milk and thereby generate more heat, and equivocally some of our summers have uh, become warmer, producers have looked for different options to ventilate and cool cows. And it's really working with the Dairyland Initiative one of the most common questions we've received is how to ventilate uh, a barn. And that's really led our, our interest in uh, mechanical ventilation options because we've seen producers going down this path uh, more and more recently. And uh, I think it was high time we, we took a closer look. We've been assisted with this effort uh, with uh, the addition of a, a biological engineer to our team, Mario Mandaka. Uh, he has a PhD in uh, computational fluid dynamic modeling, uh, applying these models to biological systems, uh, building different uh, types of cow to help models. Uh, and originally we had a, a, a collaboration uh, over our positive pressure tube systems that we've been implementing on farms. So Mario was able to put together a lot of the, the standards that uh, we see in the industry for building uh, these facilities, avoiding a one to two degree C increase within the barn, um, creating insulation in the walls, um, making sure that uh, uh, we're removing noxious gases and moisture from the barn. So there are uh, standards uh, certainly out there and they would look something like this on an interactive scale with uh, temperature increasing along the uh, the x-axis, that we would uh, set some kind of minimum uh, ventilation rate, and that would deal with uh, air quality from a noxious gas perspective. And then we would need to uh, set a minimum ventilation rate to remove the, uh, the heat generated in the barn uh, and uh, also the moisture. Ultimately, you're going to re uh, reach some maximum practical ventilation rate uh, that uh, maxes everything out. And so the pathway we want to follow uh, is to follow this yellow dotted line uh, and in most of our ventilation systems have a plan to stay on the left hand side of that line so that we are removing noxious gases, moisture and heat from the barn uh, optimally so we don't cross over uh, to the dark side on the right hand side of that line. The issue that we've had um, that we see in our industry is that um, a lot of the science behind the regulations stems from a series of studies back in the 1950s. And there hasn't been an awful lot of peer reviewed uh, revisiting of some of these recommendations. And so it's really led to different companies uh, going it alone and, and updating them 
uh, on their own and adding variable speed, fans, controllers, sensors. And ultimately, uh, what we've really seen is an awful lot of confusion and uh, a lot of confused producers trying to work out what the best system uh, is for them. So as we've visited uh, farms in our industry, uh, we see three major ways of specifying uh, a facility. Could be through airspeed, and generally the uh, recommendations for airspeed have increased over time. We see many barns uh, specified at five to six mile an hour winds across the cross-sectional area of the barn, or even more than that. Bearing in mind that in cross-ventilated barns fitted with baffles, that this recommendation deals with, with airspeed under the baffle, not the whole cross-sectional of the area of the barn. The second approach is to focus on body mass or heat transfer, um, making sure there's, again, removal of heat from the, the facility. And those recommendations, again, dating back to the 50s, have been increased over the years. And typically, we see 1,000 CFM uh, per adult cow or more being used uh, uh, out in the industry. And then finally, uh, the third method is to look at air changes per hour, uh, traditionally aimed at four in the winter, 40 to 60 in the summer, and 15 to 20 during transitional periods in between. So those are the three main ways of specifying a mechanical barn. And these are the potential benefits that we get. We get more control. We can control the, the airflow through the facility. We can orient that barn north, south, or any which way we choose because we're not uh, uh, dependent on uh, prevailing wind so much. Um, there is an advantage that we can build facilities uh, for more cows in less square footage, taking up less land. We can put barns closer together. We can put more animals in a single barn. And uh, having just spent uh, a few days on farms uh, that have significant fly and bird uh, concerns, uh, a lack of bunching and bird problems and fly concerns is a, is a selling point of these facilities. So with that, we've certainly seen an increase in the interest in uh, tunnel barns and cross vent barns. And obviously, we've, we've seen uh, tunnel barns in the past. Uh, many of those facilities, but they've uh, had somewhat of a resurgence uh, these last few years. Uh, and the construction of very large cross-ventilated facilities uh, has been a feature of the industry over the last five years or so. So let's uh, visit airflow in these mechanical systems. Uh, this is one of Mario's CFD models for a tunnel barn with air entering one end. And you can see really directly the, the major issues of, of tunnel ventilation in that the air generally wants to flow down the alleyways. This is the central feed alley in this uh, facility, and that's where you see the maximal airspeed. And generally, wherever a cow is living, uh, that's where we see much slower airspeeds. Air is fickle. It always wants to go where we don't want it to go uh, through the path of least resistance. So we've played around with different approaches. Instead of bringing air through the end uh, wall, through the, the feed lane, now we bring air through the side uh, at the end of the barn. You can see the Chris Isley's out here with a, a fogging device. We can see that fast moving air uh, penetrating into the barn, moving directly across this whole pen width uh, in this tunnel barn as it comes in and then joins the air progressing down the length of the barn. So you can really see that good air distribution from that sidewall inlet. That helps us bring air directly into the cow space. And uh, the newer facilities will see temperature or even uh, temperature and humidity controlled uh, curtains uh, on the sidewall at the end of the barn here, uh, on the end uh, wall here in a wider facility, uh, separate from the feed lanes, which uh, were uh, traditionally and historically used as inlets. We've brought the ceiling lower to try to keep the air closer to the cow. So this barn has been fitted with a false uh, ceiling with insulation. Typically, these uh, are determined by the end wall of the, the drive-through feeding door. So they're about 18 feet or five and a half meters high. But as soon as we put a ceiling like this into a barn, uh, we realize then that there is no option to go back to natural ventilation. Uh, we've blocked the ridge. We don't have uh, roof slope. Uh, and so we've got a different uh, uh, problem here in that we have to think about winter inlets. And you can 
visit the end of the, this barn opposite to the fans and you see right up here the winter inlet system bringing cold air in high up around the uh, uh, the roof line here uh, so that it hopefully warms as it enters the barn. These uh, facilities have uh, an attraction to some producers in that we can now move away from curtains uh, on much of the sidewall to a, a cheaper, easier to maintain polycarbonate uh, uh, sidewall, which you can kind of see here uh, with the, the ridges there. Uh, lower cost and again, easier to maintain than curtains. While we'll still see tunnels uh, fitted with baffles, uh, I generally have, have moved away from baffles, particularly for this uh, type of design. They, uh, we'll show you later how air uh, behaves uh, a, little uh, a little differently around, uh, around these baffles. Um, generally what we've uh, opted more for is to see a lower roof pitch. Uh, so instead of that three or four in 12 roof pitch of naturally ventilated barns, uh, we're now down to one or two uh, uh, in 12 in terms of a roof pitch. So this is an offset roof with a controllable ridge uh, here in this, uh, in this facility. However, none of these strategies in tunnels have really solved the main problem of ensuring that we've got, we get fast moving air uh, in the resting space. And how do we manage to do that? Well, we've gravitated back towards fans uh, over the resting space as we have done in naturally ventilated barns. Uh, many of these tunnel barns now uh, utilize fans to have that fast, uh, fast moving localized air. What about our uh, cross-ventilated facilities? Well, they have the immediate advantage that the air now moves perpendicular to the feed lanes as it's pulled across the barn. This is an eight-row uh, model of uh, a cross-ventilation system. Again, you can see the fast-moving air around the fans, but even within these systems, any cross alley, uh, either at the ends of the barn or in the middle, uh, you will see that uh, air uh, coming out of the pens and flowing directly through uh, those cross lanes at very fast speed. You can even see little short circuiting of air uh, around the lane associated with the fan uh, in this area here. So there are some challenges with air distribution that we're seeing uh, with, uh, with cross vent barns, but many cross vent barns have really utilized the baffle, particularly over a head to head platform of stalls like this to redirect and get that nice fast moving air uh, in the resting space. Uh, and baffles do a great job of, uh, of that in these types of facilities. But um, I appreciate you may not see this, but the air uh, after that baffle tends to sort of billow around here. This feed curb is also a baffle and it gets redirected upwards. And what we see is we see air getting trapped uh, up high up in between the baffle. So this is a, a flow dynamic model of that. Here we've got a baffle here and a baffle here. They're both above head-to-head -head stalls. You can see that in these white lines here. This is the feed curb and what we see is that air, uh, that nice fast moving air coming under the baffle. Uh, it's fast for about the, the length of a stall platform and then it gets pushed up and we start to see that circling of air, uh, slow moving air uh, trapped up here, not proceeding towards the next baffle, not exiting the barn predictably. And that has been an, a significant issue of this design uh, with cross ventilation systems of how do we deal with this trapped air up high between the baffles. So the feed curb acts as a baffle, a low baffle that drives air upwards. The baffles trap the air between them uh, and it can be a problem not only in the summer but uh, in the winter too with very low air speeds particularly in these very wide bodied barns where we're adding more and more rows of stalls. And there is a realization as we've uh, looked at many of these facilities that uh, the focus has been on airspeed below the baffle and not air changes per hour. And uh, I just wanna show a, a, a demonstration of that. Um, so solutions and uh, finding ways to cope with these challenges, one would be uh, changing the height of the baffle or fitting retractable baffles. In this facility here, we see uh, a curtain system as a baffle rather than a solid uh, baffle. We've got uh, a curtain system that we can uh, lower uh, for the summer and raise during the winter. I kind of like that idea uh, to, to help with airflow. 
Uh, but some have, have actually moved away from baffles altogether uh, in favor of uh, the utilization of, uh, of fans. And so this barn uh, is specified not on airspeed under the baffle, but on uh, body mass and uh, heat exchange and air changes per hour. And you can see here as we look towards this end, which is the inlet side, these fans located to help um, improve the flow of air across the barn, excuse me, um, and get that nice fasting, fast moving air in the resting space as we proceed towards the, uh, the fan uh, outlet side, which uh, is creating the negative pressure within the barn. So just to demonstrate the impact of, of focusing on these three different ways of specifying a barn, cross-sectional area wind speed, air changes per hour, and CFM per cal. Uh, this is a tunnel ventilated 500 cal barn uh, specified out at 500 feet per minute across the cross-sectional area of the barn. We'd get 47 air changes per hour and just under 1900 CFM per cal. Based on our minimum standards, we're doing pretty reasonably across the board there. And I'm gonna just skip straight to the 16 row uh, cross vent. We're seeing more and more of these facilities built for larger numbers of cows, two to 5,000 or more cows. And also we see this facility specified at 500 feet per minute. Now look at the air changes per hour and the CFM per cow. Uh, based on that specification. If we just did this alone, we would be very low in terms of our air changes per hour, only 24, and be pretty marginal at the CFM per cow at just over 1,100. And I think that uh, uh, represents some of the challenge of designing these facilities, of making sure we not only get the high air speed, particularly in the resting space, but also the heat removal from the barn that we actually get that predictable flow of air and sufficient air changes per hour. Uh, that's where we start to see the challenge of some of these facilities. Hybrid barns are uh, uh, an interesting uh, version of uh, these mechanical systems because what these try to do is retain a natural ventilation option, particularly during the winter. And so to do that, you have to have a managed ridge that ridge opening has to remain uh, either with a curtain or with a, a cupola system fitted with fans so that we have some mechanism to retain uh, that uh, flow of air up through the ridge. And for these hybrid barns, we also need sidewall curtains, uh, typically along the length of the barn. Now, there is a question that uh, we are only reverting back to a natural ventilation option in the winter uh, so we don't need the whole sidewall uh, open as a curtain. It could be a partial curtain with polycarb below. However, I suspect on a cost basis, there isn't a huge amount of savings to be had, uh, but we're, it's certainly something we're looking into. So with curtains and an open ridge, uh, what we have here is a barn that uh, retains flexibility, uh, but it comes as a cost because uh, we're increasing the cost of uh, construction. Uh, over uh, a mechanically ventilated barn that we would just run all, all year round. But it also has the most flexibility and uh, one day perhaps we're, we may well be asked to uh, ensure that uh, all the cows have access to the outside. Uh, I'm not sure how I do that in a 16 row cross vent, but I could do it in a hybrid. So uh, it does give you that ultimate flexibility for the future. So what we see here is a, is a tunnel barn uh, fitted with uh, sidewall curtains uh, and up in the, uh, uh, the roof here, it's a lower roof, an insulated roof, but we've got couplers up here. And if you look up into those couplers, uh, you'll find an exhaust fan uh, that isn't really there to pull air through the sidewall. Um, it's really there just to help facilitate uh, the flow of air up uh, through the ridge. Uh, as that uh, warm air rises. So it just keeps it flowing. When the roof pitch is not ideal, it's at a lower roof pitch, uh, not ideal for natural ventilation. So I kind of call that assisted natural. Um, it's, it's kind of a, a little, little difficult to get your head around, but you see this tunnel barn here, uh, built with flexibility in mind, uh, with these couple of fans up in the 
uh, up in the ridge here. Uh, again, not there to draw air through the sidewall, but just to help facilitate the flow of air up through and out of the ridge, uh, hence the word assisted. So in both types of facility, we've, we've gravitated back to ensuring that we have fast moving air in the resting space. That seems to be a, a huge priority for us. And uh, we're, we're again using fans. And I think just recently um, working with Ken Lordland and realizing that the, the, the pen is a micro environment for the calf in a calf barn, I've started to take the view that the, the cow uh, is in a stall and that stall is a micro environment within the cow barn that we ultimately have to make sure that our ventilation system uh, incorporates sufficient airflow through. This is the impact of heat stress during the summer on resting behavior. Uh, this was a six day period. We were tracking 30 cows in a, uh, a large facility, a freestall facility. Uh, each day it got a little hotter and a little hotter. This is the temperature humidity index. And look what happens to lying time. We go down from a honestly not particularly good 10 hours a day. We'd like to be closer to 12 there. Uh, we, we go down within the course of six days to six hours of rest per day. We've lost four hours of rest per day in just six days. Very tough to do uh, with even poor stall design or overstocking. That is a huge insult on the ability of our cows to rest during the summer. We've been very interested in looking at ways that we can uh, get the cow to tell us uh, what type of ventilation, what type of microenvironment uh, she wants. So there's a concept uh, that Mario and another grad student, Ian Atkins, has been working on of biofeedback, using the available technology um, around the cow to tell the ventilation system uh, how to work. So we've got a, a cow in our uh, facility next door on campus. Uh, she's tricked out with uh, a hobo with a temperature logger. Uh, she's got a line time activity logger on her leg, and uh, um, Ian had uh, created this uh, really nice uh, respiratory rate monitor. So we were able to track all these different things uh, and watch one cow in a stall with all this information for THI, uh, for body temperature, and this bar here is telling me whether she's standing up or lying down, standing up or lying down, and the open dots being respiratory rate. You can see this cow very predictably. Uh, as she stands, she cools, her body temperature decreases, and as she lies down, her body temperature increases at the rate of about a degree Fahrenheit an hour. So it's a pretty significant uh, increase in body temperature, and we see respiratory rate going up with that, uh, with that increase. Again, this microenvironment concept of these cows in these stalls, generating heat, getting hotter, and that having an impact on her ability to stay uh, lying during these bouts of heat stress. This is more of uh, Ian Atkins' uh, data showing uh, THI, showing the, the warming of a, a day here and the association uh, with respiratory rate. And you can see there is some uh, association uh, with ambient THI, but there are obviously some other factors involved uh, driving uh, respiratory rate throughout the day. And here we have respiratory rate against uh, the cow's body temperature. And you can see that body temperature varying depending on whether she's in a stall or in the holding area being milked, uh, returning to the stall, coming through milking. And what we really uh, focused on here was uh, one of the issues of our mechanical ventilation systems of making sure that we don't switch the cooling systems off too early. Uh, these cows are still have uh, elevated body temperature. They still have an elevated respiratory rate uh, later into the evening, into the night uh, that we still have to accommodate for uh, with our mechanical systems. So trying to work with the, the, the industry, trying to give produ producers a framework uh, to navigate all the different choices and concepts out there. Uh, these are the, the three things we're going to ask of a correctly designed ventilation uh, system. Number one is fast moving air in the resting microenvironment. Absolutely key uh, to keeping our cows lying down during the summer. Number two is sufficient air changes per hour 
to remove the heat and moisture from the barn. Fast moving air alone isn't going to get it done. We have to get the heat out of the facility. And then the third is remembering that when we design a wonderful system for the summer, it has to work as well in the winter. And too often we're finding facilities where uh, one of the one or more seasons are forgotten uh, in the design process. Cows prefer fast moving air when they're hot. Um, not a lot of strong data to tell us how fast, but we're going to suggest that it's about 400 feet per minute or two meters per second. And you can see these cows at our Emmons Blaine facility they huddled around a fan. You can see them all lying in that nice fast moving air cone uh, on this bedded pack system. Traditionally, in our naturally ventilated barns, we've spaced these fans too far apart, too high up, uh, and we're not getting that nice, fast-moving cooling air at cow level. And when we've done that, in our, even in our naturally ventilated facilities, lo and behold, the cows stay lying in the stalls more. See, these, the angle of these fans is steeper. Uh, they're closer together, typically every other roof post, if they're at 12 or 10-foot uh, centers. Uh, and we're really trying hard to distribute that fast moving air over every row of stalls, typically activating fans at around 65 Fahrenheit. Just to uh, spend a moment on fan specs, these are seven different fans that you would put over uh, stalls with their CFM uh, output per fan. Uh, what you can also see on this slide is the watts used per fan and uh, a number that I think we should be uh, interested in as, as dairy producers uh, purchasing and running these fans, uh, we see a twofold variation uh, across uh, different products in terms of CFM per watt. Uh, that is bang for your buck, and you should take a closer look at that uh, when you're being recommended uh, a fan out there in the industry. If we ensure that we have fast moving air in the resting space, all we need to do is provide sufficient air changes an hour for the barn as a whole to ensure that we get the heat and the moisture out of the barn. We don't have to overventilate the entire barn when we look after the microenvironment of the stall. So perhaps we could even tail back on our, our 60 air changes an hour uh, to even 50 or 40, but certainly we don't need to be up around the 80s or 90s. So with all this variation, just to conclude uh, uh, our, uh, this talk with the, the most up-to-date information that we've been uh, putting together, um, can we identify an economical solution? So I challenged Mario uh, to design a group of facilities and then work with the industry to find different ways to ventilate them and look at the operating costs. We based all of our designs uh, around a common uh, core pen design, which was basically uh, the average uh, cow pen in Wisconsin, based on a survey we'd done back in 2015. Uh, so this is a, a two-row head-to-head pen uh, housing 126 cows. It's 308 feet long. And all of the facilities we designed used this uh, common core design pen that we would use from our Dairyland Initiative uh, recommendations. So here are the seven barn designs that Mario came up with. We had two naturally ventilated facilities, one with fans over the stalls at 24 feet, uh, another at 48 feet, which was the older recommendation. This is our new recommendation. We've got two tunnel barns um, where we've got uh, fans on the end wall and we've got a controllable uh, inlet on the one end. Um, and these are spec'd out at either 40 air changes an hour or 60 air changes an hour. So at different levels for uh, turnover of air. Um, we've taken that tunnel barn and we've turned it into a hybrid by having these uh, couple of fans up in the ridge and extending the sidewall curtain, not just from one end, but down the entire length of, uh, of the barn. So very similar barns, but curtains along the sidewall and fans up in the ridge for the, for the hybrid. And then we designed two cross-ventilated barns, one at eight row uh, and then one at 16 row, both designed to optimize air under the baffle at 500 feet per minute. So these facilities have the exhaust fans along one wall, uh, the inlets along the other, and are designed very uh, similar to many of the cross-ventilated barns that you'll see out there. So this is a, just a summary of each of those seven facilities. 
uh, showing the fan distribution uh, that we did add fans over the stalls in our Tunnel 40 uh, and in our hybrid. We chose uh, a smaller 50-inch uh, uh, fan uh, for the Tunnel 40. Uh, we chose the larger 72-inch Cyclone for the, for the hybrid facility and uh, uh, the two cross-ventilated barns. This is some um, information Mario put together again showing the variation in our industry on uh, circulation and exhaust fan uh, CFM, CFM per watt. We use the mean, uh, we use the average fan that we have data for, for these models. But there is significant variation and that does have an impact on the cost of operating these facilities. Capital building costs, uh, we didn't include excavation, manure handling, the holding area, the backup generator, but we did include construction costs for the barn, uh, the fans, the fan installation, the electrical supply, uh, and the installation of curtains. And we were helped greatly by some local uh, Wisconsin builders that actually quoted these facilities out uh, for us as if they were dealing with a, a paying client. So we really appreciate their help. The running costs were modeled for seven U.S. regions uh, over uh, a six-year period, uh, activating fans using different ramping functions to get from that winter to summer uh, set points, uh, putting in electrical usage uh, as a baseline at 10 uh, cents per kilowatt, but putting variation into our stochastic models to show the variation there. Uh, we did not include maintenance cost of fans, and that can be a considerable part of this, but we didn't, uh, didn't include that at this stage. This is the, the three ramping functions. Again, remember we switch from winter ventilation at a minimum level. Uh, how we get to the, the, the summer level, uh, we could go in a linear fashion, we could go in a three stepwise fashion, or an exponential fashion. Remember, we're always wanting to be on the left side of that uh, curve uh, as we try to remove the noxious gases, the moisture and the heat from the barn. So capital costs, let's, uh, let's cut to the chase. Let's get down to the, the nitty gritty here. We uh, looked at the building costs, the ventilation cost, financing over a 10 year period. Um, what have we got here? We've got the cost of these facilities uh, in terms of per cow per year, 289 for our baseline naturally ventilated barn. Uh, 297 for the, the one we would prefer with fans closer together, going through the tunnel barns all the way to our most expensive option, which was the hybrid at $336 per cow per year. And then just emphasizing the, these, the cost savings that we can uh, achieve, particularly in very large facilities. Again, we're housing over 2,000 cows in this 16 row cross vent here. In a terms of cost per cow, that is lower than anything else. And we're doing that by adding more rows of stalls without adding uh, fans and increased uh, ventilation. So just, just to give you the range, $246 to $336 per cow per year for setup. In terms of operating, I've got two lines here, one for Madison, one for Jacksonville, Florida. And obviously the, the fans are going to be on in a much uh, longer period in Florida, just to give you that perspective. Um, total operating costs per cow. So this is just operating the ventilation system. Typically, most mechanical systems are going to be in that sort of fifty to seventy dollars per cow per year range. Um, again, the uh, the the higher costs related to uh, some of the uh, the tunnel facilities. Um, Two point zero nine times more for a hybrid than a naturally ventilated uh, uh, facility with twenty four foot fans and Remarkably, again, a 16-row cross vent, almost identical operating costs uh, to that naturally ventilated barn as well. And we see those savings uh, ever more uh, in a hotter environment when the fans have to work more in the naturally ventilated facility. So to summarize, most mechanical ventilation operating systems cost about the same in, in temperate climates in the U.S. at about two to 2.4 times the cost of a naturally ventilated barn. Those uh, costs increase in the uh, hotter climates, about double, um, uh, except for the, uh, the, the very largest cross vent barns. And the cost savings of those six, that 16 row cross vent relate to those added cows with no additional fans. 
and can be certainly very attractive in the hottest climates that we see in the US. These are total costs now for building and operating the system uh, in these two climates. And this is just to highlight, uh, yes, the uh, Hybrid 40 is the most expensive barn to build and operate, but actually only 22% more uh, than a natural barn at 20 uh, uh, with fans at every 24 feet. And again, just again, highlighting the cost savings of the very largest uh, uh, cross vent barns. So wide body cross vent barns are the cheapest to build and operate, but they have some operating issues. And we highlighted those challenges uh, earlier in this talk with regard to the use of baffles, predictable airflow, getting sufficient uh, air changes per hour. Those solutions have not been uh, all realized in those facilities. And so there are some uh, challenges there, but I can certainly understand why producers look at them, uh, that they're attractive, and uh, I can understand why many of them are being built now. The hybrid tunnels are the most expensive to build and operate, about 22% more, um, but they also have the most flexibility. And um, that significant difference is just in terms of milk, uh, just straight milk, two pounds of milk per cow per day. Um, that's, uh, that's an option where we can really look at uh, building the best facility for the cow and realizing that it's not that much more expensive than some of the other options. And that's really what I want to get towards is building the best facility for the cow in the environment that you're in. We can fine tune these systems. We can play around with them a little bit. When we make a recommendation to turn the fans on at a lower temperature, you go from 72 to 68 as the activation temperature for fans over stalls, it's about a $5 per cow per year difference. Uh, it would cost another $5 per cow per year to go down to 65. So uh, those numbers do increase, and we've got a number uh, for that. Ramping functions, uh, setting variable speed drive fans, uh, using more sparing ramping functions, give us an opportunity of about $12 per cow per year uh, in operating costs. So when we look at things like biofeedback and these cost-saving approaches, when electricity is cheap, these uh, approaches have to be relatively low cost. Uh, when the electricity costs increase, then they become much more attractive. But $12 per cow per year is not a lot of wiggle room for a lot of these sophisticated monitoring devices. And then just in terms of the operating costs per cow per year, when we fit in uh, some of the fan variation uh, with, uh, with these models. So this is the stochastic model of these seven different barns in Madison and Florida. Yes, the NAP24 is always cheaper. Uh, the Tunnel 40 uh, is the most expensive here on this one. But look at the, uh, uh, the variation that we see uh, caused by the choice of fan uh, across the board here. And there's an awful lot of overlap uh, in the middle here that we could make the wrong choice in terms of a fan and increase our operating costs considerably. Choice of fan can impact these costs by $30 per cow per year or more. So really a strong message to, to focus on the efficiency of these systems, uh, the fan choices that we're making and making sure you're making the right choice there. So in summary, um, if location and orientation allow, uh, I still think a naturally ventilated barn is a, is a great option for our cows, but uh, we're gonna put uh, fans to assist that fast moving air in the resting space. And again, I think traditionally we've gone uh, too far apart and not optimized the distribution of that fast moving air. I think it's absolutely viable for our industry to look at mechanical ventilation solutions. Uh, particularly where the site is compromised, uh, where wind shadows are likely from ad adjacent barns. Uh, and within those, uh, the criteria that we're going to set for those systems are uh, fast moving air, air in the stalls, uh, adequate ventilation rate in terms of air changes an hour in the summer and winter, and making sure that we transition between hot and cold weather uh, efficiently without uh, uh, crossing over over the line and putting cows uh, in a uh, situation where there's too much heat uh, and moisture in the barn. 
Well, hopefully I've described cross tunnel and hybrid barns as having pros and cons. They each have uh, strengths and weaknesses. And again, I, I think we really need to look at the farmstead situation, uh, look at what we need to provide for the cows and design the facility that best fits that given situation. In some, I think that is going to be a cross ventilated barn. In others, uh, it could be a tunnel or a hybrid. Uh, I think the benefits of good ventilation are going to far outweigh the negative impact uh, to the cow. I can't do the things that I do, particularly with the Dairyland Initiative, without our generous sponsors that allow everybody uh, free access to our site. Uh, we've just uh, run our workshops last week and uh, we'll enjoy seeing you uh, uh, at uh, more of our workshops in the fall. Um, I will invite you to get more information from our um, updated site. It's been completely rewritten, translated into um, Canadian French, so there's a, a language option. We've got some plans for, to add more languages in the future. And uh, with that, I thank you for tuning in and listening to me. Okay, very good. Nigel, wonderful job. Your uh, excellent, uh, uh, good framework, as you said earlier, to uh, get us uh, oriented here to making some decisions about our ventilation system. So we certainly appreciate uh, your great overview, and uh, we uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, a couple of uh, questions that I might have that you can be thinking about uh, when we get back to the question and discussion section here in just a minute, uh, do I, can we assume that you did not include any evaporative cooling like in the bent cross vent barns and you can respond to that later and then also you might feel free to make uh, any comments you might have on stocking density uh, as it relates to uh, ventilation design and, and, and heat stress and so forth. But anyway, uh, with that, uh, we want to uh, Mention to those of you folks that are out there with us that uh, you'll be receiving a survey here in a couple of days, and we certainly appreciate your response uh, uh, to that. The, uh, uh, also, this webinar in a couple of days and all of our previous webinars are available uh, in the Horge Dairyman uh, uh, archives and, free and available for your use, so we uh, encourage you to consider that as well. And then looking ahead, and our next uh, webinars, just a heads up on those. As you can see on Farm Feeding Diagnostics, our co-host and partner, Mike Hutchins at the University of Illinois, will be uh, the presentation uh, presenter uh, that time by uh, Angie Amoto, uh, sponsorship. And then looking just a bit further ahead, uh, Dr. Daryl Nightum from Cornell University and will be bringing us an update on the transition cow work and observations, uh, research and observations that uh, his group have made out there. So uh, with those comments, uh, uh, perhaps uh, Nigel, you might want to respond to the uh, couple of questions that I had and, and, and Dr. Hutchins, uh, are there some other questions? You bet. Let's go right into that and uh, go right to the evaporative cooling question that Steve raised here. Uh, Nigel, uh, Dr. Nigel Cook, we're pleased to have you on board here. Uh, what's your uh, What's your answer to uh, Steve's comment there? Yeah, this was um, this was about ventilation systems. So we did not include uh, the addition of water to, to to cool the cows. Obviously, with the cross vent barns, they're often associated with the option of evaporative cooling. Um, that can work extremely well in uh, low humidity environments, not so much in high humidity environments, um, but also obviously uh, soaker systems, uh, mister systems, high pressure fogging systems. Uh, that'll be another uh, set of questions and perhaps for another webinar another day. Uh, this focus of our project was about the ventilation of the barn. Then stocking density uh, uh, absolutely impacts the, uh, the quality of the air, the heat generation in the barn. Uh, bearing in mind that uh, uh, the old adage of a, a doubling in, in stocking density can be compensated for by almost a ninefold increase in ventilation rate just shows you how important uh, the number of animals in the barn uh, is. And I think we, we certainly see examples of that. So uh, absolutely stocking density uh, is important uh, in terms of uh, ventilation requirement 
Uh, and obviously, you know, the, a lot of the heat is coming from the animals themselves. So uh, you double the number of animals, that's an awful lot more heat in the barn that you've got to deal with. Very good. We have another question here that came in quite early, actually. What about pneumonia issues in uh, cross-ventilated barns? Uh, I have visited, I'm not the eye person, I visited some uh, barns in Wisconsin and farmers were complaining about that. Thoughts on that, Dr. Nigel Cook? Yeah, I think we've uh, we've explained that um, that uh, in a, in not all, but some of these uh, facilities, particularly during the winter, they're asking the air to go an awful long distance between the inlet to the outlet. You know, 12, 16, 20 rows of stalls. Uh, the air is getting trapped inside, and the specifications for these uh, facilities are not being achieved in terms of air changes an hour. So. Uh, they can be at, uh, at very low air changes an hour and very low effective air changes an hour. So we've got all that moist, stale air getting trapped in the barn. And absolutely, we, we, do, we do see pneumonia risk as a result of that. And it's one of the downsides of, of, uh, of that choice of cross-ventilation system. Putting in retractable baffles, putting in secondary inlets, um, probably not building them as wide, maybe a max of 10 rows of stalls. Uh, would be solutions that are uh, being looked at for that problem in particular. Uh, we have a case study, I, I guess, uh, and I'll read it to you hopefully uh, more slowly, Nigel, and that is uh, from one of our Pakistanis people. Uh, they, they got a 2,000 cow uh, freestall barn, 300 cows face-to-face in a row and with open side walls. And they have three kinds of summers, and you can probably guess who they, what they are. He lists them as high temperature, low humidity, High temperature, high humidity, high temperature, high humidity with low oxygen. What should we do <laughs> outside of moving to Wisconsin, of course? Uh, yeah, I mean, so so the, the, the issues here are um, with an open sidewall barn, uh, making sure that we've got fast moving air in the resting space coupled with uh, um, the use of water to, to enhance cooling. And in low humidity, we could go uh, with a uh, high pressure fogger system uh, where we could actually cool the air over the animals. That's what we see a lot in our, our dry lot dairies out west uh, with the um, corral cool kind of systems. Um, but uh, we could, uh, in high humidity, uh, put uh, soaker systems to actually soak the cows at the feed lane or in the holding area. Uh, but uh, in that type of open facility, focusing on fast moving air in the resting space and then using water to try to uh, either directly cool the cow or to cool the air before it hits the cow, those would be the things I go for directly. Dr. Cook, another interesting question. Will there be any op- uh, any option for a positive pressure ventilation for ventilating cow barns? So what is the limitation uh, on, on this type of approach? Yeah, we, we've certainly looked at uh, the use of tubes, and, and uh, we can use tubes, uh, tube systems over the stalls uh, to create fast-moving air in the stalls pretty efficiently, um, but we are hampered by uh, the, the types of fan and the capacity of the fans that we have available. They're better suited to using these systems in places like holding areas where they're not so long. Um, these systems won't generally develop the air changes an hour for the whole facility that we want to see, uh, but can be used as a supplement in smaller facilities to to bring that nice fast moving air from the outside uh, jetted down directly on the cows in the resting space. But again, just going back to those three things, fast moving air, uh, sufficient air changes an hour, and getting from the summer to the winter. You've got to achieve those three things to have success. Tough to do that with just tubes. Okay, uh, again, Dr. Cook, a question. What about horizontal fans? Uh, Any thoughts about those types of ventilation uh, approaches? Sorry, horizontal fans? Yeah, uh, they mentioned a rotor, a guido, uh, the the big ass fan is another one we'll see on farms. Okay, yeah. Um, so so the, the large, high-volume, low-speed fans uh, will certainly move a large volume of air, but they do so relatively slowly. Usually air speeds are under 300 feet per minute. So we're not getting that 400 feet per minute target air speed that we want to see in the resting space. So um, they probably have a place uh, for just enhancing air movement in sort of marginal 
uh, circumstances, but when we're really trying to tackle heat stress, um, they're, they're simply not moving the air fast enough for my liking to, uh, to optimize that. So uh, they, again, probably have a place in more marginal circumstances to just help move the air around. Um, but uh, I, would, I would prefer uh, looking at more um, directed fans for usage over the stalls in, in hotter climates. Okay, Nigel, uh, another question. At what uh, temperature and humidity level do you recommend to stop fans? And he says sprinkler, but of course today we're focusing primarily on fan. Do you have a, a cutoff number you like to use? Generally, we're still using uh, you know temperature to drive these systems. We'd love to use humidity as well, but humidity sensors are um, somewhat unreliable and tough to keep going in, in a barn environment. So that's kind of a work in progress. Most of our fans over the stalls are coming on at around 65, 68 Fahrenheit. Um, you may do that in a stepwise uh, or just put everything on at that temperature. Um, soaker systems typically coming on at about 70, 72, and then stepping up at around 85 to a more frequent uh, soaking. So uh, generally fans about 65, soaker systems 70, 72 would be the common uh, set points for those systems. We noticed some comments, uh, uh, Nigel, on insulation. Uh, thoughts about insulating, uh, I obviously, depending on the roof height or, or if there's exposed to the, uh, to, to the roof itself. Uh, any thoughts on insulation besides, I think you mentioned the, the sidewalls? Um, yeah, those for, for sort of the, the engineering specs. Generally, we, we like to see in, uh, insulation under our roofs. That it, it can certainly help with uh, uh, just keeping uh, cows... Uh, uh, a little cooler in the summer and uh, help with freezing of manure in the winter with, with roof uh, lining insulation. Um, so yes, definitely a, a supporter of, of insulation under the roof. We have another question, uh, Nigel Cook, that came in from Pakistan, but I think it'll apply to Florida and the U.S. as well. And, and that is when you have high temperature, high humidity occurrence, do you recommend the tunnel type system or the cross ventilated system uh, out there? Um, the, the, the layout of the ventilation is really just going to determine which direction the air moves. It, uh, it depends on whether you're uh, incorporating um, with cross ventilation systems, you can incorporate evaporative cooling more easily. That doesn't lend itself well to that, uh, to that situation. So um, you could certainly do a cross ventilation system without evaporative cooling um, or a tunnel system. And in those systems, we could uh, move more towards uh, uh, soaker systems to directly wet the cow in these high humidity environments. But the cross of the tunnel really just determines the direction of the air. Okay. So, certainly, uh, the one question would be on size. Not, nothing was said if I'm looking at 500 versus 1,000 versus 2,000 cows. Is, is there any size factor that comes into some of these decisions, uh, Dr. Cook? Yeah, part of that was, you know, we're building around this common unit uh, and most of the designs we put together were for a thousand cows and the majority had two 500 cow barns. Uh, the difference was in the cross vent, we had a thousand cow eight row barn, but when we wanted to go to uh, a 16 row to show the, the benefits of that, we actually had to increase the herd size to about 2000 cows. So those cost savings of that 16 row cross vent uh, are kicking in at about 2,000 plus cows. And it's important to realize that. So uh, as we, we look at the, uh, the eight row, there, there really aren't very many uh, savings compared to uh, some of the tunnel systems. It's only when you add those extra rows of cows without adding additional fans that those savings come into play. So yes, it really, there is a size component to that uh, cross ventilation systems. The uh, the benefits you'll see in terms of operating costs are for the 2,000 plus cow uh, facilities. If we're building, say, a cross ventilation system for a, a robot facility with, say, 150 cows, uh, those cost savings aren't going to be uh, in play. It's a much smaller facility. Another question came in about distances between barns, assuming that that's the system they have. How much space do you need to have between barns to helpfully have some good air flow, flow as far as that goes? If you're expanding, you're going to add more barns to an existing situation. 
Yeah, it varies with the type of barn. So naturally ventilated barns, if you look up the, the recommendations, you'll be at uh, uh, distances of 200 feet or more uh, to avoid the wind shadows. Practically, we just don't see that uh, uh, occurring. Uh, the average uh, space between a new barn built for natural ventilation is about 100 feet. Uh, that's pretty typical in our industry. And, and simply, I, I think that's, that's too close to optimize uh, natural ventilation. Uh, with tunnel barns, um, really the focus is on uh, uh, water capture from the, the, from the roof. So without any kind of mitigation system for capturing the rainwater off the roof, you could space those barns at about 60 feet uh, apart. So you can put tunnels closer together. That's uh, somewhat the attraction of those. Um, obviously, with a cross vent, you're putting everybody under one roof, um, so you're decreasing the size of the, the footprint uh, directly. Maybe just in general terms, my last question here would be uh, payback. Uh, we had options. You mentioned options, uh, D uh, Dr. Cook, in terms of $5 savings here uh, for uh, and, and that. W what's the payback in terms of either milk production or reproductive performance? And any guidelines in terms of, of what I could expect if I'm going to invest X dollars in my facility for ventilation? So, yeah, I mean, we, we know heat stress uh, impacts production uh, disease, all those kinds of things, and uh, poor pneumonia in the winter. Uh, our approach has re really been on identifying the costs that we can really get a good handle on in terms of operation and building, and then turn these differences into, into milk production and working out are these differences within you know the realms of biological possibility? If it's going to take 20 pounds of milk per cow per day to pay for a, one system over another, that's probably not viable. If it's two, uh, I can believe that when I walk into many barns and we're losing 20 pounds of milk per cow per day during a, a five or 10 day heat stress spike in Wisconsin, that uh, we should be building the, the best barn for the cow and, and realizing those advantages. But very hard to, to put all those uh, numbers together for the potential benefits because they're going to be farm specific. Um, but we have a, a, a grant in play and hopefully we can get funded to make those extra steps and get to those kinds of answers by modeling the impact of these systems on individual cows and their production and health. Uh, but we don't have all those numbers right now. Well, Dr. Nigel Cook, just an excellent job with some wonderful answers here. Uh, Steve, we're going to turn the program back to you to, oh. to wrap it up. Okay, thank you, Mike. And again, thank you, Nigel Cook, for a wonderful presentation, well illustrated, uh, very thought provoking, uh, uh, very well done and on time. <laughs> and you did a great job with the questions uh, uh, as well. Uh, just want to say thanks to uh, our teammates, uh, of course, uh, Mike Hutchins down at the University of Illinois. Uh, his sidekick, Jim Baltz, down there with the technical things. Patty Hurchin from the Horde staff up here does a lot of behind-the-scenes work. And then looking ahead uh, one more time at our forthcoming webinars on farm feeding diagnostics, Mike Hutchins will be the presenter. Uh, Angie Amoto will be sponsoring that one on May 8th. And then looking ahead to June 12th, an update on transition cows, their research and their observations from Cornell University, Dr. Daryl Nightum will be the presenter there. So this is Steve Larson from uh, Horge Dairyman up here in Fort Atkinson, Wisconsin, signing off and thanking you for being with us.